Hey, we're back. We're live on a given Wednesday morning for the 10 o'clock block with Roland Graham of Solar Tech Hawaii, who is our neighbor in, uh, in, on the sixth floor here at, uh, at Finance Factors Center. Welcome to the show, Roland. Aloha, Jay. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, tell, so tell me, what, you know, what, is, uh, what is Solar Tech Hawaii? Tell me about the company. Tell me about who's, who's involved in doing what. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So Solar Tech is, uh, is a PV contractor and uh, we've been around for about eight years. Our president and founder, Mike Tanavasa, um, started the company, still runs and owns the company, um, has a fantastic team together. And uh, yeah, I've, I've been thrilled to be a part of it. Mike uh, started the company kind of the grassroots as a, as a service company, doing a lot of service for, for solar PV systems. And, uh, you know, as a result um, of those first three, three years or so, you know, thousands and thousands of customers um, on their roofs, troubleshooting, servicing, you know, doing things that were needed at the time, you know, back in, back in the time when uh, solar was really, really cranking across the state. And uh, now for the last four years or so, doing both a mixture of, of service as well as new, new build outs, new systems. And, um, you know, very active, basically, you know, 50% or so of our work is service related work and 50% and of it is, uh, is new build outs. We're also finding, um, you know, a lot of customers that have had PV in the past, consumption patterns maybe have changed. Maybe their, their bills have gone up a little bit and they, they wanna add some more panels or they wanna refresh panels. Um, maybe they've had them on the roof for, you know, eight, nine years, those early adopters and uh, it's time to get new panels. So we see some of that out there, demand from the customers. And um, so that's, uh, yeah, a bit, of, a bit of the history and um, solid, a solid company with uh, good technicians, a solid crew have been together uh, for most all the eight years together as a team. So this is your headquarters in Finance Factors? Yep, yep, this is where our, our main office is at. And um, as you can imagine, you know, obviously uh, our field guys that are doing uh, all the work are in their, their mobile offices, if you will, moving panels all over the island and uh, installing every day, no matter where it's at, primarily here on Oahu. But yeah, this is our headquarters, this is where we're at. Yeah, well, this, this you know, this is something like our thing, you know, we have our headquarters, our studio here on the sixth floor of Finance Factors, but uh, like to contact people uh, remotely and so that's an example of you're in your office we're in our office we're 20 feet apart but it works as well and if, we, if you were in uh, Varanasi India it would work about the same way <laughs> and we do have we do have correspondence in Varanasi India by the way in case you're wondering right. <laughs> so, you know, are you an engineer by the way Ron I am not an engineer no I so uh, was a specialty with the company Mine is, yeah, business development and sales of the company. So I'm the sales manager with the company. And so customer relationships and uh, emerging markets um, is, is where I, I really focus in terms of growth for the company. Ah, okay. Very important. Yeah. In any tech company, that's very important. Those are the people you meet. So uh, a couple of things you said I wanted to drill down on. Um, you know, one is, uh, you know, so Mike was doing service. Mike was doing service on solar. Um you know, and I two things. One is what kind of things do you have to do to service uh, solar panels, solar installations? Um, what what is service on, on solar? Uh, I mean, some people might think that it's, it's just good uh, for twenty years, leave it there, it'll be fine. But that's not really true, is it? Well, yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, in the ideal world, that's absolutely true. That's true about our televisions, our washers and dryers, and you know all the technology that we engage with. We get them, and they come with a ten-year warranty, and we go, "Wow, we hope we never have to use that." But um, we like to set them in place and uh, and let them run and do their thing. But um, you know, solar panels are out in a fairly harsh environment. You know, they're they're exposed to a lot of sunlight. Of course, they're they're built for that. And so it's real common now for many manufacturers to be shipping products they have for years with 25-year warranties. Um, that has um, that's been pretty pretty solid for many of the of the reputable manufacturers. So in the most for the most part, you can put them up on your roof, expect them to run for 25 years. And um, there may be some, you know, some things that happen in harsher environments where uh, metals might corrode a bit in terms of mounting and these kinds of things. So you want to keep an eye on that. And that can uh, be helped by washing them periodically, especially if you're in specific areas. Uh, people ask us this all the time. Should I you know, wash my panels every year? Um, you know, our experience there in terms of service and washing, cleaning, 
is um, if, if your house is, is fairly close to the H1, that's probably where you're going to have the most amount of dirt buildup. Um, yeah. We see that all the way along the H1 corridor. There is a, there's a lot of dirt yeah. that sticks to your building and sits on those panels. Now we get a fair amount of rain uh, in you know certain sections of the H1. You know Hawaii Kai all the way all the way through Manoa and all in, in town here. But um, so if you get out into the leeward areas where there's less rain, then they're not going to get washed off as much. But otherwise, in most in most um, locations around the island, rain is washing them off pretty good. So that's the PV panel. The other piece of, of componentry to a, to a PV system is your inverters. And uh, there's two primary kinds of inverters. There's your micro inverters where you've got one inverter for every panel and um, they're mounted right up underneath the panel up on the roof. And um, so that's a piece of, of electronics that is a potential place for, for failure. The primary manufacturer of micro inverters um, in this space has been for, for years has great warranties on those things. And we're not seeing you know, too high of failure rates there. Again, for the most part, you're absolutely right. Put them up on the roof and let them run. They're 25 year warranty now on, on these inverters. And for the most part, we're not, uh, we're not seeing any major problems, but from time to time, one of those things will go out and they'll need to be replaced. And um, so that's uh, a piece of service that can happen. And then your last piece is kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, a control center with an internet gateway where it's collecting the data from those panels and those inverters. And um, in most cases, for many manufacturers, that data is being fed up to the cloud and a dashboard is available to, uh, to a consumer on their, their mobile phone, on an app or a browser, and they can see what their system is producing. They can go back and look at the records and um, see what it produced last year on February 28, if they wanted to, I mean, but usually what they're doing um, is matching it up with their, uh, with their utility bill. If their utility bill is from June 20 to July 19, they'll go take a look at their PV system and pull up the data from that particular time frame and see, you know, how that corresponds. And uh, so that's, um, that's another piece of componentry that uh, has a potential for failure. In most cases, again, it runs uh, it runs pretty solid. But those are the the service slash maintenance things that that typically will be pulled out on unless some major event happened. You know, there was uh, there was potentially a re-roofing that needed to happen, so the panels needed to be taken off and put back on. We do a lot of that, remove and replace a, a lot of that, and. Um, so that would be another reason to get out there and and uh, and touch the system. Otherwise, uh, you're right, Jay. For the most part, uh, most customers can count on that system once it gets put up there, largely running as intended for long periods of time. Well, if you if you have an option, I don't know if it's an option or it's always always part of the deal. But if you have an option to take maintenance and to pay for it or not, <clears throat> you should probably take the maintenance because uh, if you if you don't take the maintenance. Um, you may wind up spending a lot in order to catch up later. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, th there's um, there's risk and reward there, right? Um, certainly, as a as a contractor, um, you know, we want to help customers have their systems running consistently, stably all the way through, and 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 touching that system periodically, especially after the first five years, will help, um, you know prevent, right? An ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. So um, if a system goes down, sometimes it can be frustrating. Oh, I didn't know it went down. I wasn't watching it. And now you're coming in and you're doing, you know, firefighting on a on a system that has been down for a period of time. And a customer is like, you know, I, I want this back up and running as quickly as possible. And um, so you're right in that sense that uh, some maintenance, an ounce of prevention um, is a good thing to do. We at Solar Tech. You know, we provide a five-year workmanship warranty on, on our stuff. So if a customer has an issue anytime in the first five years, you know, that's that's built into, into our deliverable from the very beginning. So feel free to call us at any point in time. We want to hear from you. You got questions, you're concerned about something. We'll oftentimes log in remotely, take a look at your system, you know, the electronics, what what's what what is the production that's coming off your system panel by panel, and help do some troubleshooting. And then of course roll out there to the house anytime that's that it's needed, get up on the roof, take a look help our customers beyond that five years, um, then there may be some diagnosis and it, it, and and then potentially a quote, you know, to service something if they didn't buy that, you know, that, that service contract um, that would go beyond five years. But um, anyways, those are the options for the customer to make sure. And solar hot water, you know, we, we haven't necessarily touched on that, but but we do a lot of that and it's very similar, very similar. Um, then, then you know about Bill 25 pending in the uh, city council right now. 
in fact, all kinds of, um, you know, uh, when I say an advocacy going on around this bill. Uh, and um, so I think it's, it's worth, um, you know, discussing that a little bit. Um, so some years ago, there was an attempt at the state level to incentivize uh, or to require um, a, a solar water heaters on every new, every new residence. And uh, there were so many exceptions, I, I don't think it was all that successful. Uh, but now the city council is doing it again in this Bill 25, just coming up now. And I wonder how you think that might affect you if you're an installer of solar water heater, no? Yeah, there, there could be a number of ways that that, that, that affects us. Um, we've certainly seen communities here on Oahu, uh, specifically where we do most of our work, where um, the developer, their builder, has, um, has done solar hot water as a standard option. We've seen some of that with or without legislation that requires it, part of their competitive advantage, if you will. And um, so, um, you know, that, that has been done in the past. We um, otherwise, you know, I think a, a mandate for it um, would certainly help raise the awareness of the benefits for it. Um, oftentimes, we'll have customers contact us for solar PV, and one of the predicating questions we'll ask them after looking at their bill and doing initial assessments of of, of what their their consumptions are, we'll ask, having not seen the house, do you have solar hot water? It is um, one of those low hanging fruits, if you will. When it, when it comes to the cost of the system, the investment for the homeowner, and the return on investment over time, it, um, it, you really can't beat it for return on investment, especially with the tax incentives that are still in place at the, at the state level, the slightly reduced levels of, of tax incentives at the federal level now in 2020, um, still a fantastic return on investment, solar hot water, especially if the usage in the home is four or five uh, people or more. Um, we see that going up. Hawaii Energy, um, the uh, the incentive uh, group here, is, as you're aware of, oh, has sure. published some numbers. But it's in the range of 20 to $25 per month per person that you can kind of estimate your savings when you get solar hot water. And uh, so that's some real easy math and you can start to see those numbers. Now, obviously different families usage will, will vary depending on how long hot showers are and i'll often ask you know uh, families do you have teenagers right <laughs> because you might be on the high end of that savings maybe because of the the long showers teenagers sometimes take but uh, depending on the family profile they're going to see some savings there and solar hot water is a great way to go so i i would be in favor of that how that uh -huh. would impact us uh -huh. it, it uh -huh. would certainly i would expect drive um, demand our direction as well as any other contractors out there. Uh, but more than that, the bigger picture, Jay, I think, which uh, we all should be cognizant of, and that is, um, are we are we on a trajectory towards our goal of yes. being fully sustainable yes. as a state, yes. as as a, an island chain by yes. 2045? If yes. we don't do these, if we don't help our consumers become aware of the savings and the impact positively, then it's going to be a hard row, you know, one contractor at a time, being out there knocking on doors, talking to people one at a time. It takes a lot longer than if the legislation were to come and really raise the awareness. And um, so I, I think it would certainly have an impact on our business. That's true. Well, one other part of that bill is to make all new uh, homes, residences in, in the county, uh, quote, and I quote, because <clears throat> I'm not sure what this is defined as, uh, EV ready, electric vehicle ready. And, and this speaks of, um, you know, sort of the uh, sort of the, the decorations on setting up a, a solar program in the home. For example, if I if I'm inclined to get an EV, I would really like to connect my EV to the solar facility on my roof. I would I would like to have it all automated, all work perfectly fine together. And uh, then I've got sort of the, the perfect arrangement if I do that. Are you finding that? Are you doing that? Are you recommending it? What do you think of that aspect of the bill? Yeah, excellent. Uh, you know, a powerful set of questions there. I, I, I love it. There's, there's an irony with, with electric vehicles, um, and it's probably not lost uh, on most people who have really thought it through. And that is all around town, and, and, I, and I don't, I'm not speaking disparagingly, I'm just talking about reality. All around town, we have these EV charging stations going in, and I'm in favor of them. 
Absolutely. Um, I sat uh, about six months ago in, a, in an EV uh, seminar that was put on by Hawaii Energy and the manufacturers of EV charging stations were there. And we've seen these all around. They get the preferential parking spots in a lot of these different places. And I'm absolutely in favor of that. My question at that seminar to the group in general was, um, and I didn't, I didn't mean it sarcastically at all, right? But how many of those EV charging stations are actually pr delivering clean energy to the car? Right. Right. Because um, the, those buildings, most of those large buildings are not uh, many of them, especially in the high rise space, right, where we are down, downtown Honolulu, are, are not powered by by, uh, by solar, certainly not by the owner of that building because they don't have the real estate for it. So um, our grid, as, as we all know, is largely powered um, by fossil fuels. Now, again, our, our utility is deploying large solar fields, and that's fantastic. That's awesome. So we're getting more and more clean energy. But if you don't have a PV system at home or at the business where you where you plug in, when you plug in your EV to your house or to that place, it's worth considering where's that power coming from? Because um, if it's coming from fossil fuels, then I've essentially done the exact same thing as a consumer as going to the gas station, right? I'm filling up on fossil fuel <laughs> either way. So um, when a customer starts talking about uh, PV and EV, that's a that's a wonderful marriage. That's a that's a fantastic uh, direction to go. Um, now the question really becomes for a, a homeowner. Um, my PV system is running all day long. I might be gone. Very typical, um, you know, living pattern. You leave in the morning to go to work. You come home in the evening. Your systems have been producing all day. I come home from work, 536, 630. I go to plug in my EV. Now my PV system is going down in production, right? Sun is setting, it's going down. And so I'm switching back over primarily to my utility. So that's something to be thought through again, because you can you can buy a PV system, have EV cars, and and um, and actually not necessarily affect positively your heco bill if you're still using a lot of your stuff at night. So that takes us into the broader picture of batteries, right? How do I make sure I capture all of this PV, use it for my own consumption when there is no sunlight to actively run that that PV system? So these are conversations and dialogues that we're having. Um, with almost every customer, every customer when it comes to, and, and the same thing is for air conditioning as it is for, for EV cars. I come home, my house is hot, I crank up the air conditioning to get it cooled down, right? When I, why, when my, my PV system is losing its production, right? So my consumption in the home is, is cranking up. We come home, kids have had sports, whatever, we turn all the showers on, we're running hot water systems, we start doing laundry and, and our dryers are going, we turn the stove on, we start cooking. All these high consuming items inside the house are all running at a time when there's very little PV production. You look at the general demographic of usage, right? And um, so those things do absolutely, uh, Jay, have to be considered and thought through, and, and EV is one of those things. Well, it seems to me that, um, you know, that the, the key to reaching our goals here, really a key thing is storage. <clears throat> and, you know, you can have, there are other kinds of storage, but the one that comes to mind over, you know, right now and for the past several years, um, is, is batteries, um, and batteries are expensive. And uh, there's a bill, uh, or there will be, if there isn't already, a bill in the legislature uh, wrapping, wrapping storage um, into, into PV installations. Now, my understanding is that if you, in, if you build right now under the law, if you build a house with PV and storage, you get a tax credit on the whole, the whole, the whole package. But if you add storage later, you don't get a tax credit on that storage, which is really irrational, I'm sorry. And, and the PV interests, are probably including your trade associations, um, you know, have been trying for the last four years to change the law on that. So you can get a tax credit on, on um, you know, add in storage, which is so important. And the legislature in its infinite wisdom has not seen fit to pass that bill over the past four years of trying. Maybe in the fifth year, maybe something will happen. Um, how do you feel about that bill? Isn't that it? Bill goes beyond just incentivizing for installers like your company, uh, Solar Tech Hawaii LLC, but for the whole state, for everyone. It seems to me, if we're going to reach our goals, we have to do that. What's your view on it, uh, Roland? Yeah, I, I I totally agree. 
And there are two conversations um, when it comes to that legislation. One's at the federal level, one's at the state level. And, um, and it's worth noting um, that they obviously are two different conversations or two different legislative bodies. Um, the tax credits that are in place at the state level, um, the fact that we don't uh, hear any rumors of them going anywhere, like the federal level is, is scheduled to go down and it started that step down right. here in 2020. Right. And um, at the state level, we don't hear any rumblings of that uh, ever going away. That's great, that's excellent. I, I, I do though, of course, agree with you um, being in the industry um, that, that, that more would be better. Uh, especially here at the state level where we have some control of that. Now at the federal level, as I understand it, and this is just pretty recent news, um, the, um, the, the budget that was, that was signed uh, by the White House, uh, despite lobbying by our industry, our trade industry, for wrapping in storage with PV and extending the, the, the PV credits that are already in place, um, that has all um, not been signed into legislation, as I understand, um, at, at the White House in this current uh, this current budget, um, wind power uh, incentives were added in there, and uh, I'm not in that industry, so I can't speak to the um, the specifics of that. But as I understand it from my from my reading, um, wind power was added in there, but solar PV um, currently is going to and tax incentives are going to step down to zero. Uh, this year's 26 percent. Next year, 21%. That's in 2021, and then going to zero, as I as I understand it, uh, with no extensions currently signed into law. That's at the federal level, and that, of course, is um, that's that's it's terrible, really. I mean, there's there's no soft selling it from my perspective. Obviously, I'm in an industry, so it would make some sense that I would have some bias towards that. But but I'm talking to customers all the time as consumers, and so I I feel that I empathize at their dining room table as a consumer right, um, that I want to pencil out this investment. This is a 25, 30 year investment. I wanna see it pencil out. I wanna see it have a direct impact on my utility bill. And I wanna see this thing become an asset for my, for my house. I don't need to make money on this. I'm not building you know, equity like in buying, buying a home, we hope to build equity and have this thing you know, be a phenomenal asset. But we do wanna see a direct return on investment. And those, those tax incentives are, are a key part to making that happen. And um, so, yeah, we'd like to see that happen specifically with storage wrapped in um, as, um, as a tax incentive in and of itself. Because as you know, uh, Jay, we have a, a pretty solid history here in the state with PV adoption through the different phases, right? When, when the NEM program first came out with, with ECO, it was, you know, you know, wildly accepted, really. I mean, it, it, was, it was fantastic, the number of consumers both private and commercial that uh, that adopted it. All of those customers had no batteries, right? And so at some point in time, they may all wanna be considering adding batteries to an existing PV system without adding PV panels. And uh, it, it would seem to me that it would make sense for the state in meeting those targets, that those incentives would help make that happen because we can then offset that usage um, uh, or sorry, production of PV to be used in the, in the evenings. Without that, um, yeah, we're, we're really going to be back as consumers drawing from the, from the grid. And then it's a matter of, you know, where did that, you know, did we do massive battery systems at, at the grid level? Um, we see massive PV systems uh, being put out there, as, but massive storage, you know, is a, is a slightly different uh, beast. So I think we need to be incentivizing pri private, uh, you know, homeowners to, uh, to add, PV storage, right, yeah. to their to their systems that are yeah. that are currently producing. Yeah, hey, the nature of an incentive is it doesn't have to make anybody rich particularly. It only has to it has to tip the scale. It has to reach the tipping yeah. point where it changes consumer sentiment in a way that you know we all want. Um, and so um, it doesn't have to be huge, uh, but it has to be a sort of governmental nod, an expression of governmental policy. Yes, we think this is good. Yes, we will be able to reach our goals this way. So get on the bandwagon. And just to show you how sincere we are, we're going to give you this incentive. Um, and, you know, yeah. I think you have to tune that, um, you know, going forward. You have to, you know, you have to think about a sunset, but maybe not right away. Uh, sometimes the legislature thinks of a sunset the minute they adopt the, uh, the incentive and then everybody says, oh, they're not serious. You know, they don't really mean it. 
this is going to go away so quickly. I, I saw that happen in the uh, tech, uh, technology uh, tax credit back in the in the uh, early years of the century. Anyway, this all raises the question of the relationship of the solar uh, installer companies like yours and the solar installer industry and trade associations, um, you know, with the utility and the utilities, I say the utility, I mean all the utilities, both utilities, <laughs> um, in, in their efforts to build solar, community solar, large scale, uh, you know, utility level solar, and they can go out and uh, with uh, the approval of the PUC, they can uh, organize huge solar facilities. Um, and that has to have an effect on you um, because it means that some people who might be incentivized to uh, put solar in their roofs uh, won't because the utility will have its own solar and that's clean energy and why, sh why should I worry about my own roof? Um, you know, and, and I was telling you before that Marco Mangelsdorf, one of our uh, one of our other uh, guests on on these energy shows, um, you know, keeps keeps track of how of how much solar is being installed. Right now, we're on an upswing. Last few months, for reasons I don't fully understand, we're on an upswing. There's more solar being installed. But you know, query in the long term, how do you see this playing out? And do you see companies like Solar Tech Hawaii LLC um, being on the bandwagon for larger installations? Uh, for, you know, hundreds of, of megawatts um, that will have, you know, an effect on the on the larger picture rather than the individual, uh, you know, single family residents. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good series of questions there again, Jay. Uh, you know, we're, we're a proponent of, of, of local companies right? Uh, local contractors. That's who we are. We feed our families. We put our kids in, in our local schools. Um, you know, we're, we, we are local people. We feed back into the local economy. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're huge proponents of, of promoting uh, local contractors getting access to, you know, bidding and uh, on, on, on large and small projects, um, presuming, of course, that the contractor has the capacity to do so. And, you um, so, um, so yes, that, that, that's the answer to that question. How we see it impacting individual homeowners is um, is interesting. Um, it would, you know, I'll offer my perspective, and others might might have uh, different perspectives. My my perspective on that is one: I applaud the big solar farms. The big one of Milani just went online here here recently. Fantastic years in the building. We've got others up on the North Shore. That uh, really for our overall state goals, right? I applaud it 100%. Does it take food off our table as a small local contractor? Well, I haven't seen, unless I missed it, I haven't seen the per kilowatt rate on a consumer's bill go down just yet. And if you want to know the truth of the matter, I don't expect it will. <laughs> now, I'd love to be wrong on that. I'd love for, for one day to come home, open up my own bill and go, wow, <laughs> I'm only getting 17, kilo, 17 cents per kilowatt hour. When does the last one that up? But um, honestly, I, I don't expect that to happen, despite the fact that clearly the cost for producing power with a kilowatt, right, is so much less than on those diesel generating plants, right? Very really. interesting, Rel, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, that's a, it's a very interesting I, perspective. I, yeah, I mean, I would love to see all that, somehow that savings get passed on. And I, and, I don't, and I don't say that in a way to be disparaging towards our utility. Our utility is a partner of ours, right? They really are. And um, we, we, we may love aspects of them. We may dislike aspects of them. You know, that's true about any large organization, right? But the reality is, uh, I don't suspect, I mean, somebody please prove me wrong. Um, I don't suspect that our per kilowatt rate on our bills, be it a commercial account or a residential, <laughs> are going to go down anytime soon. In which case, the incentive is still there for me as a homeowner to, to, you know, to, get, to get my bill down. And, and PV is, is really the best way. Yeah. And solar hot water, obviously. So thank, solar thank hot water. You, Roland. Roland Graham, uh, Solar Tech Hawaii LLC, our neighbor here at Finance Factors Center. So much appreciate your your patience in starting the show and your your knowledgeability. I really appreciate that. And thank you for joining us today. I hope we can do it again. Thanks, Jay. Really appreciate the time. Glad to join the, the show. And, and best to you guys in the show as you guys continue to grow it. Aloha.